good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is that we have decided to talk about. Tonight, we, we, tonight we'll be talking about coal exports through the Pacific Northwest. And my guests are Martin Donahoe, MD, a regular on the show from time to time. He always has so many important things to talk about. You do a good job for us. And uh, first time having uh, Bethany Cotton Hi. of Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. And thank you for coming on the show. And you know this guy, do you? I do. Oh boy, it's going to be fun tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having us. <laughs> you betcha. Um, I'm a little nervous, and that's good for me because of over 12 years, and I'm usually very nervous before we start the show. But then after about three or four minutes, I calm down, especially looking at his peaceful face. <laughs> good. <laughs> How are you feeling right now? Oh, I'm doing well, thanks. Okay. Are you nervous, Martin? Oh, no. Never nervous. You always put me at ease. <laughs> You're my Zen master. <laughs> <laughs> So, as you know, the show goes in two major parts. The first part is what I call the bio segment, or the who are you segment, where I talk to my guests about who they are, kind of personally, not terribly personally, because I'm a psychologist and I won't know, mm. don't care about Freudian stuff. <laughs> but so my guests <laughs> will have an idea uh, why you think uh, the way that you do and why you're saying the things that you say. And you've done this a number, a number of times. We were doing a abbreviated version for you. And I'll start with me. I'm uh, uh, Don Bay. I'm a retired clinical psychologist and now acting, modeling, and producing and hosting my conversations with Dr. Don's show. I do a bunch of other uh, uh, citizen activist uh, things on the side. I'm a supporter of Rocky Anderson of the, of the uh, Justice Party. Uh, I'm an old left winger from way back, but that's enough about me. I have uh, five daughters, uh, all grown, now, of course, as old as I am. And I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, I like the way that I do because things got all mixed up racially down there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the result. <laughs> so uh, shall we start with you, Martin? Oh, ladies first. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go. Well, I, I'm Martin Donahoe. I'm a physician, and I practice part-time in internal medicine. And I teach occasionally at Portland State, and I manage the Public Health and Social Justice website, which is a collection of about 250 open access PowerPoints, meaning that anyone can log on and uh, use for their own teaching purposes or their own edification, uh, PowerPoints that cover everything from environmental issues to reproductive rights to uh, other areas of activism and healthcare. So, uh, and I have a book that just came out last week. Um, I still haven't gotten my copy, but it's Public Health and Social Justice, and it's also available on the website, and I think my publisher would feel I was remiss if I didn't mention that, so I'm, I'm gonna try to push a little paper tonight, too. Uh, it's, it was just up on the screen, so the viewers can see it. Okay. And very good. What do you do in your spare time? Do you have any spare time? I have some. I, uh, I like to be outdoors. I like to hike. I love living in the Northwest. I have a niece and nephew here and then two nephews in L.A., so I like to spend as much time as possible mm -hmm. with them. Uh, I always have a trick question for my guests. And, <laughs> uh, I've asked you the same thing over and over again, but I'll ask you again. If I were to ask your best friend, Martin, who is Martin Donahoe? What would you, your best friend say? Martin is what? My brother. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> my best friends right? are my brothers. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know, a curmudgeon. A, uh -huh. a, uh, I, I wish they would say Bon Vivant or Man About Town, or um, but I, I think they'd say I was a, a curmudgeon. Um, Walter Mitty. Uh, probably. Uh, Overeducated, under socialized, um, <laughs> but uh, lover of life and one who's dismayed by what's happening to the world today, and a and hopefully they would say a deep desire to try to make it a better place for my family, for my patients, and for the world at large. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and when and where were you born? Panorama City, California, suburb Cal of L.A. Yeah. 
religious preference. Did we talk about that in the past at all? Yeah, I grew up Catholic, um, and and I bless you, my son. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> I. I'm not sure what I am now. I go to the Unitarian Church occasionally, and and I must say that the story of Christ as presented in the Gospels is one of the most moving stories, and I would say the greatest model for how to live a just and worthy life. But I think, unfortunately, that story has been corrupted by not only the Catholic religion, but many Christian religions um, for uh, the wrong purposes. And I think that if people were to go back to the Bible and examine that story, whether or not you believe that Christ is the Son of God, it's just a, it's a tremendous story about um, how we should treat each other. And so I, I would say my religion is my own personal religion where I try, usually unsuccessfully, to emulate some of the best features um, of that story of Jesus's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And we know you're an MD, and you talked about what you're doing now for a living, how you feed yourself and put a roof over your head. And do you have a partner? No. Okay. No husband, no wife, no boyfriend, no girlfriend. Uh, no, no. Always, always looking. <laughs> Are you available? I am available. Okay, ladies. There he is. <laughs> Ladies out there, <laughs> you know, his email address is there, so uh, you know, any, uh, a jingle. Uh, your political persuasion, I don't know what that is, but the viewers, I'm not sure they know. Are you a, a tea party or what are you? Oh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> uh, coming from Australian and Canadian background, uh, and my parents drinking tea, I guess you could say every night was a tea party at my house growing up, but um, mm. I identify most closely with the Green Party and their platform. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to vote Green Party. Okay, the Justice Party, is that okay with you? R Rocky Anderson? Yeah, I don't know enough about him, but... Um, I'll talk to him. You, you can educate He's, me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great guy. It's an alternative, a genuine third party. It's sort of like the Green Party. They're very similar. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm a fan of Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Barbara Ehrenreich, some of the Cornell West, some of those who have spoken out so eloquently about um, the plight of those in this country and in the world who are underserved and face some of the consequences of social, cultural, environmental, and other damage that we as a society are doing to the planet, particularly brought about by the inequalities between rich and poor here in the U.S. and abroad. You're going to fall off the left end of the continuum if you keep reciting names and references like I'll that. I'll stop. Amy yeah, Goodman. I'm, I'm not name dropping because I don't know any of these guys personally. All those so. are my heroes, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations uh, that are worth mentioning for the viewers. And the main one worth mentioning tonight is Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say that I'm speaking not only on behalf of myself tonight, but also on behalf of the organization. Uh, and the positions that I state with respect to coal transports through the new to the Northwest mirror the positions taken by Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is a group, uh, mind you, not just of physicians. We have nurses, we have laypersons, and it's the and psychologists. <laughs> Thank you. It's the uh, state chapter of the national organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility, which was co-recipient along with its Russian counterpart of the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize. And so we work largely on issues related to environmental health, as well as decreasing militarism, and in particular, ridding the planet of nuclear weapons. Yeah, good organization, yeah. Persons from the past are alive today other than Jesus that you particularly admire or admired. Any other names come to mind? Well, my parents, I, I, I hate to keep it all in the family, but my, my parents, uh, sacrificed their entire lives. My father passed away in 1989, and my mother, um, gratefully, is still alive today and, and still a major influence on my life. But um, they uh, sacrificed uh, incredibly to allow my brothers and I to achieve the education that I achieved, uh, that we achieved, and to be doing what we're in the doing in the world today. And um, they lived their life basically along that model of Jesus. Uh, and and um, their teachings c continue to influence me. I think about my dad every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you make me smile? You just did. You're so good. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we move over here and take her on? Oh, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, Ms. Cotton. Hi. Bethany. Yes. Uh, what's your full name? 
My full name is Bethany Way Enders Cotton. What a four, four. It is. Where'd that name come from? It's uh, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother's maiden name, my dad's middle name, and then my mother's maiden name, and then my dad's last name. Okay. Mm -hmm. My hey. sister has the other two family names. <laughs> and did I ask you where you were born yet? I was born in Ashland, Oregon. I know that. Yeah, okay. And anything significant about your cultural heritage that's worth uh, reporting? Um, despite my appearance, I am not at all Irish. <laughs> that's, yeah, I'm glad you brought her. <laughs> uh, a religious preference, do you comment about that at all? Uh, I grew up going to the Episcopal Church um, and have spent a lot of time um, in some of the pagan practices of cross-quarter holidays and solstice and equinox, um, more with my dad, and I think at this point it's probably fair to say I'm basically agnostic, more spiritual than religious. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a humanist, uh, skeptic, agnostic, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm an atheist, not an atheist, mm -hmm. that's a pejorative. Mm -hmm. Did you, have I said it to you before? No. I should have. <laughs> uh, and what do you do to earn your keep? What's your profession other than being a member of Greenpeace? Sure. So um, I work for Greenpeace as oh. the Pacific Northwest representative for the Quit Coal campaign. Um, so I work specifically to prevent coal exports in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and my background is in environmental law. So. Um, primarily Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act work, uh, but also National Environmental Policy Act and other environmental laws and regulations. And so your formal education then is in law? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And do you have a partner, a wife, a boyfriend, a girlfriend? Nope. I have a lot of plants. You two need to go together. <laughs> I think I've got food in my refrigerator older than Bethany. Are you available to the right man out there? I suppose. Mm -hmm. You guys got that? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to, what do you call the, the Jewish faith, the, the Yento matchmaker? Uh, oh, make me a match. Find <laughs> me a fine. Catch me a I've seen that oh, movie about 15 times. Oh, you guys are going to sing it tonight. Huh? Love it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I can guess at your political persuasion. Would mm -hmm. you make a comment about that? Uh, I'm quite liberal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Progressive. Yeah. Whichever one of those you'd like to say. Progressive. <laughs> liberal. Is that term coming back into fair usage anymore? Liberal has been tarnished and, and uh, degraded by the right wing. Never mind. I'm grinding my axe now. Uh, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations worth mentioning other than Greenpeace. Sure. Uh, well, I, I do a lot of work with various conservation and environmental groups. Um, that's where my real heart and passion is. Um, and I uh, work in a coalition um, as part of Greenpeace in this larger coalition called Power Pascal mm -hmm. that is uh, more than 100 faith, environmental, conservation, community, and public health organizations that are working together to prevent this threat of the coal export proposals through the Northwest. Uh, and it's a really diverse and very interesting um, alliance that's formed with groups all around the West and also with Canadian allies to do that work together. Uh, everything from really small neighborhood groups to um, and the international organization that I work for. It's commendable uh, what you're doing. Uh, so, are you a member of the ACLU? I don't think I'm a dues-paying member of the ACLU, but I certainly support most of their work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't pay a lot of dues as an, at, with my uh, law school debt and my nonprofit salary. Dues are tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, any persons uh, from the past or alive today that you look up to or admire? Oh, sure. Um, there's certainly lots in, in terms of really impressive environmental work. Wangari Mata is in, a total personal uh, hero of mine. She did such amazing work. Uh, yes, yes. And, Say her name again. Uh, I hope I'm going to pronounce, I know Wangari is correct. I think you pronounce her last name, Matai. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Wangari so Matai. And, um, you know, of course, in terms of social justice issues and, and peace work, um, 
the Dalai Lama. It's probably one of the, the living people who I most admire. Uh, and the, the list is long, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, there are definitely lots on there that um, I feel are really impressive examples for us all. Gandhi's there, too. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a T-shirt that I wear. It says, my heroes, uh, Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Yep, Dr. King, of course. Che Guevara. And when I get, when I get down to Hugo Chavez, the people are reading and they're smiling and they get down toward the end, they say, well, how did he get on that list? <laughs> you need to be enlightened to what you need to do. But anyhow, those are some of my heroes to, right. um, to live those, the life that those people lived. And people find it funny since I'm a humanist and an atheist how I can lead my list with Jesus. And uh, that's a, a remnant of my old Catholicism. I was an altar boy for years, too, mm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's, how do you see the mainstream media nowadays? Uh, is it left or right or center or what? I don't get as much exposure to the mainstream media uh, as maybe I should to be to adequately address that. I'm an NPR addict and listen to um, local radio stations um, and read a lot of more alternative media out there, um, mostly online. Um, but I don't own a TV, and I love living in a house that doesn't have a TV. Good um, for you. <laughs> so, and I Have haven't you. for years and years and years. I haven't had a TV. Um, so, so you I, won't be watching tonight's program. No, I hear all the time. I get. I, get, I saw you on the news last night, and I said, "Oh, okay," because <laughs> uh, I do not have a television. Um, so, I I think I miss some of the more conservative radio and and TV that's up there. So, I think in general, it's it's certainly more conservative than I am. You ready for your trick question? Sure. Why were you born? Oh, well, my mom really wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was time. It's yeah. about nine months. Yeah. Brothers and sisters? Uh huh. I have um, a younger full sister who um, is just about to get married. So we've been having a little fun planning her wedding um, to. Uh, wonderful young man from Spain. So they're getting married in Spain. So Ooh. I have an excuse to go to Spain in the spring. Um, she just finished grad school in Iceland and is now back. Um, I haven't gotten to see her yet. She's back in the U.S., but she hasn't been up here to visit yet. Um, and then I have a half-sister who's 12, um, big soccer player uh, in, down in Ashland, and um, a couple of step-siblings, um, one who's in college and one who's a senior in high school. She's the senior class president in uh, Ashland High School. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. You have an interesting, interesting background. Mm -hmm. How did you meet this guy? We met uh, around the coal issue. So I actually, um, Greenpeace shares an office with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, which is a very pleasant working environment. And um, so I do a lot of work with them. And we testified together before the Portland City Council a few weeks ago. Um, was that the first time? I'm not sure if that was the first time we met. Um, I think that was. Might have been the first time we met, and then um, there was the bar back in the, the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Are we, are we filming? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So perhaps we'll take an early break this time before we get into the main part of the program about coal exports through the Pacific Northwest control room. Can we take a break now, please? Can you hear me in there? Good. We'll be taking a break now. So the mics are going to be uh, for a couple of minutes. That's a long game.
Professor. We Bye. are back. Thanks for staying tuned. And for your viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to, to, to talk about. And I was going to finish this without bumbling the words. <laughs> the title of today's show is Coal Exports Through the Pacific Northwest. My guest is Dr. Martin Donahoe and Bethany Cotton, mm -hmm. uh, attorney, lawyer. Mm -hmm. Don't tell everybody that. <laughs> <laughs> and we've spent the first half of the show talking about who my guests are, so now we can get into the meat of the show and talk about coal exports to the Pacific Northwest. I had a couple of leading questions myself. Why is it useful to talk about coal exports to the Pacific Northwest? Why is it useful for us to talk about that tonight? Bob, you take that. Sure. Well, I think it's the single largest threat to the environment in the Pacific Northwest. That's pretty and, big. And one of the biggest threats globally to the climate. It has potential to, be, to have absolutely catastrophic impacts for our shared climate. Um, we know that we're way above what we need to be in terms of greenhouse gases, and if we're going to curb them, we absolutely cannot um, ship 150 million tons of coal a year out through the Pacific Northwest. And then there are just totally huge impacts locally and regionally from these proposals. And I, I think it's super important that people learn the facts um, and ask the hard questions and ensure that we get a complete analysis of all those impacts and that that happens before any decisions are made or any permits issue for any of the proposals that are currently out there. So that's a, a major ask that we have out, that the federal government conduct an analysis that looks at all the proposals cumulatively and make sure that we get both a full environmental impacts analysis and also a public health analysis. And with all of that, do you think the federal government is going to be, uh, today's federal government is going to be objective in deciding whether or not coal trains can come to the Pacific Northwest? Well... With the money and the influence and power of the industry? There's definitely some concern, but I think there's a lot of power in citizens and in communities, and we're seeing that all across the region, uh, across political persuasions and in communities that are typically thought of as quite conservative, as well as communities that are thought of as liberal. We have now 27 different uh, municipalities, towns, or ports that have passed resolutions, um, either outright opposing or at least expressing significant concern. 27. 27. Um, and 170 elected officials around the region, um, and more than 480 healthcare professionals. Uh, also, the um, 57, well, 59 tribes have called for complete analysis and expressed very serious concerns about impacts to their health and to the environment and to their tribal uh, treaty fishing rights um, that are posed by these proposals. So there's a huge amount of concern, and there's a groundswell of opposition um, that just continues to grow. Uh, so I think it's very important that folks get the facts and get informed about it because the impacts, they will impact everyone. Um, the degree to which it impacts folks depends on where you live and how close you are to the tracks or, or um, to the Columbia River. But um, in terms of climate, in terms of mercury toxicity, in terms of um, impacts like that, everyone will, will feel the negative impacts of these projects. Well, who is for uh, uh, coal uh, through the Pacific Northwest? You name some of the organizations or people who are, are, are pro. Well, there's folks who are interested in jobs at really at any cost. And um, there's no doubt that we have communities here with high unemployment rates and, and folks that are struggling, uh, which is, of course, unfortunate. And we want everyone to have uh, a chance at, at a a good job and a um, family living wage, but we have a lot of concern that the jobs associated with this are, are really dirty jobs, and they're jobs that will not only impact the health of the people doing them, but will also have really serious impacts on uh, lots of other people and on lots of existing businesses and on the potential for us to continue to grow a more sustainable economy and for the kind of green brand Oregon, green brand Pacific Northwest to be the way that we're thought of it well into the future. So the real, really the only argument we hear in favor is one that there will be some jobs produced. 
Do you want to say anything at this point in time, or do you want her to carry on? <laughs> She's doing great. Uh, <laughs> at some point, I'll pipe in and discuss the health and environmental consequences. Mm -hmm. But would you like me to do that now? Whatever you, you two decide. I'll follow. Yeah, wh why don't I divide it up into uh, the risks associated with the diesel particulate matter from the diesel engines that power the trains, the risks from the coal dust itself, the risks from the carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, all the gases that are released into the environment. And that will all be significant enough to cause... And the mercury. Cause, uh, well, there, there's significant consequences. So to, to, to get a sense of the numbers, we're talking about 150 million tons a year being sent from the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, about 1,300 miles by rail, and then by at least one of the proposals by barge down the Columbia, coming right through the Northwest, which will act as the coal chute to China and India and Korea and countries in Southeast Asia. So 26 trains a day, uh, each one to one and a half miles long, consisting of over 100 cars powered by four diesel engines. 26 trains a day? One direction. Mm. Right. And so the diesel particulate matter that's released by the engines powering these trains is associated with asthma exacerbations in young children, increased admissions to the hospital for heart attack, increased risk of stroke, increased risk of heart failure, and increased risk of certain types of cancer. The coal dust itself can impair lung development, can contribute to pulmonary fibrosis, or basically stiffening of the lungs. Of course, causes black lung disease in coal miners themselves, and over 100,000 people have died in the 20th century from black lung disease from working in the coal mines. Well, isn't there a difference between just what's wafting off, off, off of these cars uh, into the atmosphere versus working in the mine where you're well, really breathing it in That's a very good question. In fact, that's one of our major concerns because if you're in the mines, of course, you're going to have a much greater exposure yeah. and be more likely to develop black lung disease. If you're not in the mines, there are large amounts of dust that actually blow off of these trains. And it's about what percent, Bethany? Well, so the coal company or the rail company itself did a study and they found that up to a pound per car per mile which means up to 500, between 500 and 3,000 pounds per train car. And in, you've got 128 train cars the air. per train. So there's huge amounts of coal dust that we're talking about potentially. Now, obviously, some more blows off near the mines than elsewhere. Uh, it blows off more in windy places. It blows off more when the train goes around a turn. So it's not totally uniform. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be more study of that. Um, but we do know that the Columbia River Gorge is one of the windiest places around. That's what makes it a world-class destination for kiteboarding and windsurfing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the trains are going to be going through communities of color, through poor communities. Um, they're going to be predominantly impacted. And this dust is also going to be uh, blowing off into the gardens of those who are growing their own fruits and vegetables. Uh, and There'll be that much, huh? Oh, yeah. And communities of color and... Uh, and um, uh, other diverse communities here in Portland tend to have lower rates of having health insurance, higher rates of poverty, so they already have a number of comorbidities that would be made worse by exposure to the coal dust itself. Then there's, of course, the whole issue of noise. These are going to be quite noisy trains. They're going to be going past schools, past businesses. And one of the jobs issues that we're concerned about are all the jobs of those who have businesses that are near the train tracks. Because as these trains cross the tracks, they're going to cause delays of anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes. And so it'll make it difficult for simple things like people getting to work or going to shop, but it'll also cause delays in emergency vehicles getting through. So there will definitely be people who will have, say, a heart attack or a stroke, where basically time makes the, and minutes makes the difference between life and death uh, that will be affected by this. And there'll also be accidents. And um, it, ironically, the coal dust itself, as it blows off, gets into the soil that's underneath these tracks, making them less stable, making them less able to drain water off uh, during heavy rains. And of course, we're a very rainy climate here, making those tracks less stable, leading to coal, de coal train derailments. And there have been at least 12 derailments this year nationwide. Just this summer. Just this summer, which have included a, a, a few fatalities. Mm -hmm. So. Um, this noise is going to affect children who are learning in school. It's going to impact those who have mental illnesses. It causes hypertension, heart arrhythmias, disturbed sleep, and is associated with, of course, 
poor quality of life. And we really value our quality of life here in the Northwest. It's one of the reasons that I moved to Portland, um, because I love the outdoors. Uh, I love the air that we breathe. And, and as we get into this more, you'll see that this is really a, a, a almost Dickensian future we're looking at with a 19th century technology uh, that we're going to be burning. And we're going to be uh, burning in China, but we're going to be shuttling through the beautiful Northwest with dust blowing off and diesel engines giving off more pollution. Is there a guesstimate as to how many years this will go on? And yeah, Bethany, do you want to handle it? So there's not. Um, it's a really interesting situation, um, just to back up a minute for about why this is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so this country has basically decided that it's time to move past coal, that coal is an exceptionally toxic, it's the dirtiest fossil fuel on the planet, uh, mm -hmm. and that the impacts to human health and the environment are just too stark. So we are seeing, um, rather than new coal-fired power plants being built around this country, we are seeing coal-fired power plants being shut down at an unprecedented rate. Um, so for example, just in September, just last month, two of the dirtiest coal plants in the country that are in, in Chicago, downtown Chicago, both the Fisk and Crawford plants that um, a Harvard University study said was killing, resulting in the premature deaths of 42 people a year, just those two coal-fired power plants. Really? Um, after 30 years of organizing by the communities, they finally shut those two plants down just last month, and it was a huge victory for the community, and that's happening across the board, and there are new regulations about um, how much pollution is allowed, and, it's, and those technologies are expensive, and rather than retrofit their plants, these, the companies are just deciding to turn them down, or to turn them off, mm -hmm. uh, shut them down. And uh, we're also seeing that we have cheaper natural gas. So there's also a move towards um, natural gas, which when it's fracked has its own issues, um, to which is probably a whole nother show. Um, <laughs> yes. But we are seeing very low natural gas prices here. And um, at least uh, conventional natural gas is much less polluting than, um, than coal. Uh, and we're seeing, so we've got this situation where this country is moving away. Um, from coal. And, but we have companies, huge multinational companies, who own um, leases and who want to make some money off this toxic rock that they've got their hands on. And we have a very interesting situation where this coal is coming from the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, uh, which is almost all publicly owned land. So it's our coal, it's our resource, it's our material. Uh, and these coal companies come in and they um, bid on a lease, but because there's an odd um, exemption for Powder River Basin, it's, it's actually designated as a non-coal producing region, which is oxymoronic because it, there's 40% of the coal in this country. But because of that designation, there are very few regulations about the Bureau of Land Management's leasing process. And these leases, historically, on average, um, the coal has been leased for $1.17 a ton. So you can't get a cup of coffee in Portland for $1.17. Mm -hmm. But if you're a coal company, you can buy a ton of publicly owned coal on public land for that amount of money. And the last lease that occurred Which back is in, then sold for. Right. And so the last uh, lease that occurred was in, in June, actually <laughs> went for $1.10 a ton. And they're not competitive, so only generally only one of these companies even shows up to bid. So there's no competitive bidding process. Um, and then they can go and sell it overseas for $100 a ton. So that enormous public subsidy is why this is even possible, that these companies want to dig up coal, ship it 1,300 miles um, on rail lines, poisoning communities the whole way, send it down through the National Scenic Area that is the Columbia Gorge, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Uh, and then put it onto huge ocean-going vessels, cross the Columbia Bar, which is one of the most dangerous bars in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and then ship it halfway, or really all the way around the world, to the other side of the world, where it will then poison communities in Asia. And then, ironically, uh, there have been studies done by the federal government that 18% of the mercury pollution that we experience in the Pacific Northwest is actually from Asian coal-fired power plants. And Powder River Basin coal is high in mercury. So we end up getting back a whole bunch of this pollution we've exported, just like we're seeing the tsunami de debris show up on our shores. Well, that mercury uh, comes back here. And 
Oregon in the Pacific Northwest has much higher rates of fish consumption than other parts of the country, and mercury bioaccumulates in the food chain, and it particularly concentrates in cord blood. So it's a huge concern for pregnant women and for fetuses, uh, but also for the native population that traditionally eats a lot of fish, um, and for folks here who eat more. And the federal standards about the acceptable rates of mercury are based on a national average of fish consumption. So we're way above what even the EPA says is safe uh, for most folks here. So really, really serious concerns because of this huge federal subsidy, really, to the coal industry. Um, and the coal industry likes to say, oh, we don't get subsidies. Well, this is sort of a hidden subsidy, but it's an enormous, enormous boon to them. In fact, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis um, studied this program and said that since 1982, it's been a $28.9 billion um, loss to the public taxpayer um, because of these, this leasing program. Who authorizes this arrangement? So it's the, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, it's a federal government agency that's who, in charge of it. Who, who, the staffing of the Bureau of Land Management, does uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, staff uh, this organization? Well, most of the positions are nonpartisan, but it's under the um, behest of the Department of the Interior, and the Secretary of the Interior is um, Ken Salazar. Salazar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other interesting subsidy is that uh, for these proposals is around the rail. And we have a lot of very pro-rail law, much of which is 200 years old from the development of the country, um, that really gives a huge also public subsidy to development of rail. Uh, and rail is a really interesting and important part um, of our infrastructure in this country. But we should be focusing on high-speed passenger rail and on transport and on really um, upgrading all of our engines to the most efficient engines that are possible and then using it to transport sustainable goods. Um, instead, they are talking about transporting the dirtiest fossil fuel on the planet. Um, and, and that would foreclose more sustainable uses of these rail lines. And most of the work that's done on the rail line is paid for by public taxpayer dollars. So we're paying for this, huh? Mm, in more days than one, with your lungs and with your wallet. Toxic rock. Someone was saying the other day in another meeting I was in that uh, the economy of China is kind of faltering and uh, there's a lot of coal to be mined in China. Mm -hmm. So we're sending coals to Newcastle. No. <laughs> <laughs> How can China be buying coal from us when they have tons of coal of their own there? Well, that's a really interesting question. And it goes back to those subsidy issues that it actually, it, because the government subsidizes this coal so much, it can actually be cheaper for these coal companies, Peabody Coal, Arch Coal, Amber Energy, these huge multinational corporations, to mine this coal in the United States, ship it across the entire Northwest, put it on huge ships, ship it halfway around the world, and sell it than it is for Chinese, the Chinese to just move coal across their country. Because China does have a lot of coal. That's hard to, to, to get it is. To wrap my mind around. I agree. <laughs> I, it's crazy. I mean, there are mornings that I wake up and I say, I can't believe I spend my days doing this. I can't believe we're even talking about this. I mean, it's. Uh, I worked on the effort to shut down the single coal-fired power plant in Oregon, Boardman, because of the really significant environmental issues with that plant, the sulfur dioxide and the nitrous o nitrogen oxide and the mercury pollution that comes out of a plant, not to mention the greenhouse gases. And that was a huge community effort around the region to get the agreement that that plant would be closed. Similarly, um, that happened in Washington State as well, and they'll be closing their single coal-fired power plant. And in 2007, I spent the summer in Washington, D.C. Um, as a law clerk when, when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't afford to live in the district. It's very expensive. So I mm -hmm. lived out in Maryland, and I took the metro in. And I was sitting on the metro one day reading a book, and I looked out the window, and the tracks are parallel, and there was a train full of this black stuff and it took me a couple minutes to realize what it was and it was a train full of coal and I remember thinking well at least we don't have those in Oregon uh, for the moment famous last words mm -hmm. uh, and so it is I do find it literally hard to believe that we are even considering this oh, these projects I was in a meeting the other day and somehow or other uh, I suggested a hundred years from now, uh, people are going to look back to this time in the earlier part of this century 
and say, what were those people thinking about? Because at the rate we've been going historically and in, in developing and learning new stuff, mm -hmm. and we'll be uh, getting our energy from all sorts of other sources, as, uh, as soon as we manage to and get the money and interest from the super rich and the extra, extra powerful corporations from influencing the entire process, then in the natural evolution and learning, we will have all sorts of alternatives uh, to uh, fossil fuels. Uh, we already do. If, what if we had a Manhattan Project, for example? Well, if we can put a man on the moon, too, within a decade, we can solve the energy problem. And, and uh, the, the costs of the dirty types of energy that we use today are highly subsidized, um, both through tax breaks from the federal government directly, but also through the externalized costs, which are those health and environmental costs. Right, sure. and, and Bethany mentioned mercury. Mercury is a significant neurotoxin that affects fetuses as well as adults. And between 300,000 and 600,000 women in the United States have toxic levels of mercury in their system. And uh, global warming is another item that Bethany had mentioned, and that's probably the biggest effect that we're going to see from burning the coal, because that coal that's burned gives off carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, also some contributors to acid rain. The acid rain will mostly be deposited locally, but the carbon dioxide, the carbon monoxide, the methane that's released travel across the planet and contribute to heating up the planet. And already it's estimated that global warming contributes to about 300,000 deaths per year worldwide. And that number is certainly going to dramatically increase over the next 15 to 20 years. The time to do something about this is a couple of decades ago. Uh, the alternative forms of energy are available, and if they were subsidized to the degree that current dirty sources of energy are subsidized, then we would be energy independent, meaning that we wouldn't have to have much of a military presence in the Middle East. We wouldn't be fighting unnecessary wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we could completely divorce ourselves from that part of the world and just maybe have our military do things like run humanitarian ventures and give the United States a better name in other parts of the world that would make large parts of the world who now don't look that kindly on us think better of what we do. But, you know, I think of this along the lines as what we saw with tobacco. The tobacco companies noticed back in the 1990s that their market was tapering off in the United States and that they needed to find other markets, other places to ship the tobacco. And so under the Clinton administration and with the um, work of Minty, Mickey Cantor, who was the trade representative of that at that time, as well as even through the, the uh, work of Mitt Romney and our wonderful folks at Bain, we opened markets in Asia and in Russia, respectively. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw smoking rates double in Russia. We saw a lot more tobacco sold overseas, and that's what we're doing. We're taking a 19th century technology, and we're using our tax money to send it across the planet. This has nothing to do with energy independence, to create awful health effects for those of us living here in Portland, those who live in China. Uh, and every life is a valuable life. And so uh, I, I think it's important to, to take a step back and say, OK, we're going to create a few jobs, but we're going to lose some jobs. We're going to lose some jobs of local businesses as they go out of business. We need jobs for the 21st century. We need jobs that are associated with better health, not jobs, say, working at rail terminals where the coal workers in Australia have three times the rate of cancer than those. That's good data. Than, yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, this is all peer-reviewed. And there's a wonderful peer-reviewed study in the New York Academy of Sciences that looks at the life cycle costs of coal. And their estimate is anywhere from a third to a half a trillion dollars per year cost to the U.S. economy when you add up all the externalities of coal. And in fact, they, those are very conservative estimates. So I'm all in favor of good jobs. I, I've spoken out at SEIU rallies on behalf of single payer. Uh, I, I applaud the unions for all the wonderful benefits they brought us over the years, the eight-hour day, the five-day work week. I'm very pro-union. But these are not the kind of jobs that we need here in the Northwest. We need jobs that are healthy jobs, that are lasting and sustainable jobs, that will not put workers and their families at risk. Um, this is a jobs program really for neurologists, pulmonologists, special ed teachers, and morticians. And They're desperate. Those people uh, need to find some sort of way to eat. And they, if the only way I, I can earn enough money to put a roof over my head and eat is to take this kind of job, then I'm going to take it. And I, I appreciate that. And I think that's why this needs to be attacked at the policy level, statewide and federal government-wide, so that we, as the richest nation on Earth, 
have policies in place that promote those kind of jobs, that our tax policies promote those kind of jobs, that our regulatory bodies like the BLM promote development of that kind of energy because that's the future. That, that's where the jobs are really going to be. And if we're going to lead the world in alternative energy, we better jump on the train. And I don't mean the coal train. So how, how do you change the, the, uh, the, the process such that the government behaves more responsibly and uh, their primary interest would be the welfare of the commons rather than the, 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 the pockets of the super rich? Well, there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, one one thing we do is we ask the federal government to develop an exports policy for, for fossil fuels. And to look at that, we demand that the climate impacts of mining and transporting this coal be included in the analysis. We ask that the health impacts be included in the analysis. Um, and we say, you have to look at the whole program. You can't just look at the dredging in the one place where they want to build a dock and only look at the actual driving the piles in that dock, that that's not an acceptable way to analyze the impacts of these proposals, that you need to look at the fact that we've spent literally billions of dollars uh, restoring ha habitat for salmon and restoring the commercial and recreational fishing industry in the Pacific Northwest, and yet we're seeing ocean acidification threaten all of that, and now we're talking about sending coal trains, literally the train tracks in the Columbia River Gorge are between the highway and the river. Yes. They're as close to the river as they could possibly be. And then one proposal actually wants to put coal in barges and send it down the river. And they have yet to explain how that's remotely safe or what would happen if there were an accident or a fire um, or a barge sunk. Um, because one of the reasons they don't cover the coal trains, other than that it's expensive, is that Powder River Basin coal is very friable. Uh, it tends to spontaneously combust. And industry papers about handling Powder River Basin coal talk about how um, it's not an issue of if there will be a fire, it's when at the terminal and how coal trains often show up and some of the cars are on fire. Um, so we've said, well, how are you going to enclose a barge with an entire train load of coal and send it down the Columbia River? How is that not an incredible threat to the environment to the habitat and to people. What happens if that coal um, ends up in the water? And, and nobody's answered that question adequately yet, or at all, really. Um, so there's that proposal is being sold as the most environmentally benign, as the best one where they've addressed environmental concerns, which completely ignores the climate. It also ignores the thousand miles of rail lines that will have impact before they put the coal on the train. They're trying to avoid folks in the gorge and in Portland being upset about that project. And those people need to understand, one, that there are huge potential impacts of barging coal, um, and two, that if you let these, these coal companies in, if, if we become coal country, it's much harder to get them to go away. We need to stop them all, all the projects. And we need to act in solidarity with communities in Spokane, Washington, and in Sandpoint, Idaho, and in Billings and Helena, Montana, who are also concerned about all of this um, because it really is, it's not about one community here, it's about this whole region and it's really about the globe and, and it's not alright with me that there are people in, in towns in China who have literally never seen blue sky because they live next to a coal-fired power plant and there's no pollution control technology at all uh, and they literally don't know that the sky is actually blue because it's not where they live. If Obama wins in November, will he will the uh, change things? Will his administration behave differently in this situation? We don't know yet. Mm, what do you guess? Uh, I don't have a good guess. I think it um, may well depend on who becomes Secretary of the Interior in the second administration. And who decides that? Um, President Obama would mm. decide that. What, what does his past history uh, indicate he will do? Well, it's unfortunate Ken Salazar is a good friend of the fossil fuel industry, um, and he always has been. So? So um, he was a poor choice, in my opinion. Um, I would hope that it, his replacement would be a better choice. His replacement? Who will replace him? It's not clear at all. I don't know. But who will be in charge of replacing him? The president. The president, okay. Mm -hmm. What about if Romney wins the election? Do you see any change, anything improvement? Or, uh, are things con continuing the way they are or worse? I think things will be significantly worse. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Do we have an alternative to those two choices? 
Well, you, you tell us, Don. <laughs> 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 the one who realistically would be elected, probably not. But um, are there other candidates? Sure. The Green Party and the Justice Party. And I tend to think in terms of the long term. Uh, we tend to think in terms of, uh, of four and, and six years, and uh, a radical change in the government takes many, many years. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's always been. So uh, luckily in Oregon, the Democrats are likely to win. So I, I'm safe in voting for something other than one of the two political parties. My point I'm getting to is uh, looking uh, deeply at what we need to do for the long term to change things and have our country and our leadership in our country be more socially responsible, social justice, mm -hmm. uh, as a model for a number of reasons for the, the rest uh, of the world. Uh, and I'm on my soapbox again. Well, I think that's really <laughs> important. I think one thing we need to realize is that the environment shouldn't be a partisan issue. You shouldn't have to be mm -hmm. a Democrat to care about the environment or a progressive to care about the environment. And it wasn't that way when a whole lot of the environmental laws that we rely on now um, were founded. I mean, it was President Nixon who signed the Clean Air Act um, 40 years ago. What we need is for the climate to be a priority for everyone because it's catastrophic and it will impact all of us. And it already is. We're seeing greater incidences and, and bigger and much harder to control forest fires. We're seeing lower snowpacks. Um, we've got problems with dead zone off the coast and with ocean acidification. Um, and that impacts everyone, um, regardless of your political persuasion. Um, so we've, we've got to get to a place where we start thinking in those terms. And, and that becomes a basis of federal, state, and local policies. And it's important to, to remember, that this is a democracy. We are the government of the people, by the people, for the people, regardless of who's in office. Uh, and, and people hopefully will make themselves aware of what's going on and realize that the time to act to prevent this is now. We don't want our children coming back to ask us, hey, why is it that the, it's so smoggy here in Portland? Why is it that, that we have higher rates of asthma than any other place in the country except for West Virginia and some of the countries where they're actually mining it? Um, this is the air we breathe. This is the water we drink. And we need to say, we are as mad as hell and we're not going to take it. We're not going to take it from companies that are coming from abroad and from out of state, trying to make money as quickly as they can, get the coal out of the ground, sell it before it becomes entirely obsolete, which it frankly is, but they can still squeeze a little more profit out of it. And you have to remember, corporations are mindless entities. Their reason for existence is to make money for their owners or their shareholders. They do not have a conscience. The rest of us have a conscience. And the rest of us have lungs and brains and fetuses and children that we care about. Some of us now. do not think we have a democracy. We have a corporatocracy. And With, that's the point I'm getting to. We can take the country away from the super rich, the super corporations, and have our voices heard. And that means uh, uh, reversing Citizens United Mm -hmm. and, uh, camp and get the money of the political process and do something about the lobbyists and take the cut. Because uh, what we're talking about now are important things to do, but it will be uh, overridden and uh, trumped uh, by the corporations who uh, put Ken, Ken Salazar uh, in a position of responsibility that's so critically important. Well, I, I think there's no doubt that we've got to address Citizens United and corporate control. We're running control. out of time. It's, we yeah, are. It's, so, but in the meantime, you can call Governor Kitzhaber's office and tell him that absolutely no coal exports through the Pacific Northwest. And there's pending permits right now, so it's super important to do that. And one of the beautiful things about our mm -hmm. governor is that he actually has a citizen's representative contact number. And if you call Monday through Friday between 8 and 5, you actually get a live person. For you Oregonians, call Governor Kitzhaber, <laughs> all right? And what do you got to say in the next minute or so before we have to shut down? What's, I, what, do, what do the viewers need to hear from you about our program tonight and, and, and whatever else? I agree with Bethany. This is, this is the key environmental issue of our, uh, uh, for our area at this time. There are um, huge global environmental issues. This is a subset of that because it relates to global warming. It relates to the pollution of our air and our water. And that's the predominant issue facing the planet. This is the main one we're fighting here in the Pacific Northwest. We are not coal country. We don't want to become coal country. And I'll cede the rest of my time to Bethany. 
Yep, that's absolutely right. And I think what's really important to think about too is that we do have choices. There are permits that are required um, and that you can say something. You need to have your voices heard now. Uh, you need to stand up to the federal government and to the state government and to your local governments. There are cities all across and communities and neighborhood groups passing resolutions opposing coal export. Uh, so there's a huge amount you can do. If these projects were to go through, the five that are currently pending, and um, there's an independent analysis that's shown that the climate impacts are greater than the Keystone Pipeline. Okay, we gotta, we gotta stop. stop. <laughs> and go to, go to Power Beyond Coal's website. Power Pass Coal. Uh, yeah. Power right. Pass Coal. Thank you. They're yelling at me in the control room. We gotta have some public service announcements oh, so we excellent. can sign off and go home. PSA is to get the Dr. Don local broadcast schedule. Go to my website and click on present day activities. And you and uh, you get my show on the web. Go to my website again and click on favorite links. There's a couple hundred shows there through the years, and all sorts of people I've interviewed there. And I got to tell you about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be further in the tank. Go to www.aclu.org and see about joining the ACLU. To get my shows broadcast by other stations around the country, ask your local public access station to go to that website, www.pegmedia.org, and uh, you'll learn how to have uh, my shows b broadcast from your studios in the uh, East Coast or the South or whatever. One more corporate personhood. That's my favorite ax to grind now, ending corporate personhood. Go to www.movetoamend.org. We've got to reverse the Citizens United decision and take our country back. Thanks for watching. And remember KFC? No, not that KFC. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable. To you too. And you too. And you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for watching. And good night. Good night.